Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Season 3 premiere of Backwoods Investigations. I am your host, Blimp, the team leader for the Southern Illinois Monster Hunters team. And tonight, we take a trip across country to the state of California to talk about Sasquatch with a lifelong researcher and believer. He's from uh, Modesto, California. I'd like to introduce everybody to Mr. Bobby Rich. Bobby, how you doing tonight, sir? Hello, how's it going? Uh, it's going all right. Fog's rolling in, the rain's coming down, the thunder's rolling. How's it out your way? Oh, uh, it's uh, 80 degrees and sunny. <laughs> I'd, I'd, go, I'd go and trade that any day. So, go ahead. Let's get down to business. Uh, tell everybody, there's a lot of people that have tuned in to whenever you were on uh, Mojo Encounters with Bono Russell and then there was whenever you were on, did your two spots on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio. So go ahead and tell everybody that's listening that don't know who you are, go ahead and give a brief rundown. Tell us a little bit about yourself, when it all started for you, and we'll go from there. Sound good? Okay, we'll do. Well, let's see. I'm 54. Um, I was in the medical field, Had a, was forced to retire due to medical issues about five years ago. Uh, I had my first experience uh, up above me, above uh, Sonora, California, uh, in 76. And then I had four more where I deer hunt in Northern California um, up until 1982. And then just this last year, um, in August of 2017, I went to my first sighting encounter spot to uh, do a video of you know what happened, where it came from, and all this stuff. And after I did that that night, that was I had my sixth encounter. So it sounds like you've had a whole lot in your lifetime. Six. That's that I'm aware of. <laughs> that's your well that's let's just say six confirmed accounts and an indefinite number on others yes so you've been in the into uh being a bigfoot researcher for how long now well i guess probably since my first one i actually really tried to put it out of my mind because it was so terrifying but i still watched um you know all the shows and stuff on it there was really no internet, no, I didn't see any books on it in the libraries. Um, but I pretty much since then, and then uh, in the last, I don't know, six, seven years, I, then, I just got into it really heavy. But I've um, really, after my last one in 82, I didn't want to even be out in the woods by myself. <laughs> until just uh, the last about four or five years. Terrified you that bad, eh? Yes, it did. Well, you say it's terrified you. Um, has it had a lingering effect to you uh, to this day where you're like uh, kind of, I want to say, a state of paranoia, per se? Yeah, I, I still won't go out there by myself. I have to have somebody... Um, be out there if I'm out running around in a campground I'm fine but if um, I have to um, actually go out in the woods like if I hunt I have to have somebody with me or have somebody within sight of me or I'm just terrified so um, let's go ahead and let's start uh, from the first encounter and work our way down um, tell us what it was like what was the uh, placement like what was the uh, the uh, terrain like? Let's start from there. Uh, what time of year it happened leading up to it? Uh, just give us every last detail. Okay. Uh, first one was uh, July 12th of 1976. It was a full moon or just a deer tail before or after it. I looked on the... Uh, um, internet and found out the uh, the date, and um, we were camping uh, with uh, me, my parents, and sisters. They were in a motorhome, uh, and then there were 
was me in a tent with my pup. And then there were two other campers and trailers. We we're in a U shape. My parents were in a motorhome on one side. I was at the bottom of you in a tent up against this huge, huge, huge tree, pine tree. And then there were two other trailers that were um, along the creek. And this was the last night there, so it had been Saturday night, early morning hours of Sunday. And I'm guessing somewhere probably between one and three in the morning. Um, the moon was shining on the back of my tent. I was sound asleep. And then all of a sudden I heard this crunch, crunch, crunch of something walking. And right then I'm already terrified because you know there's something else outside there. And you could hear it. I'm, I'm not sure if it came down the road or if it came off the side of the hill, but it was walking um, on the lava rock. The roads are um, loose gravel, lava rock. And you could, you could hear it crunching. It was definitely two, two feet. And it went off the road and into a short area of dirt, sand. And then it went on to the river rocks that are along the creek. And then you could hear the um, rocks shifting under its weight as it walked. Well, then it got um, to the trailer by the creek that was closest to me and probably straight across from me down by the creek. And it apparently picked up uh, either one rock and was banging it or picked up two and it would bang them together and set to three. You now click, click, click. In a way, a few seconds, click, click, click. It did it like three or four times. And then um, it either put them down or kept carrying them, whatever. But it got up and you could hear it walking across the river rocks again. And then, but it was walking towards me. Towards me and I, I was in panic mode, man, couldn't move. Was frozen still, didn't want to breathe. And then it got to the back side of my tent, was probably maybe five feet from the back of my tent, and was walking straight across, and the moon was shining on the back of my tent. So it cast its shadow from like the uh, neck down or shoulders down onto the uh, tent. And I can remember seeing. It was covered with walking, standing upright, walking. It was fur. You could tell it was probably around four inches long and really matted looking because of the way it looked in the, uh, you know, the shadow on the tent. And uh, if you're looking at the, the back of my tent, um, the big tree was casting a shadow on the right side, probably a foot from the edge and it was approaching from the left side and when it i got a glimpse of it and i just let out screaming <laughs> and it did not continue going straight across it shot straight out and disappeared my uh, dad came out and um he had his uh, pistol and there was a picnic table right outside his door he thought it was a, a bear he was about to shoot it but didn't and i made him Make sure the coast was clear, nothing out there. Before I grabbed the pup and ran inside and slept in there. Uh, the next next morning, we got up and looked around, and there was there was no way to see anything because of all the uh, uh, gravel that was there. You couldn't see any impressions or anything. Everybody told me it was a bear or something, but I knew it was not. And we left that day to go home. That it was, um, yeah, there was a, a couple people that was just now sitting here listening to that encounter. Uh, whenever it come and you saw its silhouette against the tent, um, did it come walking in upright or did it walk and then stand up or what? No, it was upright when it was walking across. And how, and how long uh, did you, before you, uh, before you panicked, how long did you get a good look at it? I mean, you've, you've given such good detail. What would you get a guess on how long it was before you let out? 
probably about three to five seconds. That's the thing. A lot of people don't realize that a lot can happen in three to five seconds. And you can, if you, especially when your adrenaline's going, you can really pay more attention to detail. You notice a little bit more than you do whenever you're calm. Yeah, I was, I was already watching very intently at the back of my tent because that was lit up with uh, moonlight. So I was already watching there it just as soon as it started. Plus, you could hear it walking that it was going to cross right there. And uh, uh, yeah. uh, there's a question on the uh, chat here from a man named Dell Yetzer. He's asking, was there an odor whenever this happened? No, I had no odors with any of my encounters. None of them. Really? See, that's something, I mean, it's 50-50 anymore where you hear if it, they are reported with an odor or it's just, uh, whether it's the musky, strong, skunky smell, or if it's just nothing at all. Yeah, I don't know if they just didn't do it or the wind happened to be blowing the other way, but yeah, none of my six encounters, I had any any smells. Hmm. Uh, let me give you a kind of idea of the territory. It was, it's uh, about 6,500 feet up in elevation. Uh, it's uh, uh, pine trees and uh, brush wise, there is buck brush is low growing shrub with stickers. Uh, there are gooseberries, which are edible and they're very stickery. Uh, manzanita, which will grow probably 12 feet tall. It's a, also a shrub. Um, the, pi the pine trees in that area are um, pretty big. They're anywhere from like a foot to three foot in diameter. They're pretty decent sized. The, it is a um, volcanic area. So there is a lot of uh, lava, loose gravel lava around and also uh, big uh, boulders and mountains made out of granite and just so happens there in camp it was uh, uh, surrounded by big granite mountains and huge, huge boulders the size of houses and um, then on the what side would be south side was a like volcanic hill that was where it was crunchy, and so I'm not sure if it was coming off of the hill or coming down the road, which was also paved in the uh, the lava. But this area we were camped in at that time was not a public campground. It was one that we invented, actually, um, along the creek. And it was pretty much open, wide open. There were some aspen trees, the big pine trees, like I said, I was parked or backed up against one and there's uh some willow bushes um near near the creek and this was actually it stopped just before one of the patches of willows uh is where it was doing the banging so that's what the area kind of looks like okay i got uh two questions here on the chat uh one comes from uh, James Lowe. He's asking, can you describe the shape of the silhouette you saw? The shape? It was a almost total side view of it, but it was turned slightly towards the tent. If you know what I mean, it was like walking by sideways, but it was kind of very slightly turned towards me because I can remember I could see its left shoulder as well as the, as the uh, right shoulder. Hmm. Uh, was it like a V-shaped torso, hourglass-shaped torso, big pot belly on it? Um, I would say it was pretty fit, but you wouldn't be able, I couldn't really tell uh, the like V-shape or hourglass shape because it was walking mostly sideways um there's another question here um michael cairo is asking he's asking did you find any traction or did you even stick around to find any uh we looked the next morning or i did nobody else believed me um i did but i couldn't find anything 
at all. And then we were we packed up and left that morning. So, so you didn't really that. find anything. No, the ground was um, lava rock, like I said, like the road was, but not as bad. The only place that I could have pops possibly seen it, but I actually didn't even check, was where the very where it went off the road. I had to walk slightly into some dirt to get to the uh, river rock. That would have been the only place that I would have actually got to see any that I, and, and I didn't go over there. I just looked behind my tank tent and looked um, where it was pounding the rocks at and where it came off the, the mountain or road. And I couldn't see where any of what it did. Hmm. Yeah. I've heard, um, in my years, I've been researching in the woods, doing my field research. I've heard rock clacks before. Why do you think that they uh, choose rocks to clack with whenever they're surrounded by trees a majority of the time, whenever they could be knocking wood on wood, instead they're picking up rocks? I don't know. It's just maybe because it was down at the, right at the edge of the river, or at the creek. It just was the closest thing. The, the biggest tree... It was by by the willows, and there was you could have knocked on those. The biggest tree was the one that was behind my tent. Maybe it was going there to to knock when I screamed. Who knows? But um, but it was right down there with the rocks, so it just they were handy, probably. And do you think that there could it, there could have been with it clacking rocks? There was probably more in the area that it was trying to communicate with. At the time, I didn't know anything about them, so um, but. From recent uh, information about them, yeah, I'd say it was communicating with others in the area. That's going to make the hair on your neck stand up even now to think that there could have been others. Yeah. Um, did, uh, Michael is asking another question. He says, did you have a fire going outside the tent, the tent or a lantern going? Or No, it was. Uh, we would have had a fire that evening that would have been put out. Uh, we usually go to bed um, like 10, 11 o'clock at night. So that would have been put out before we went to bed. And there was no uh, lanterns going because it was somewhere between 1 and 3 in the morning. I probably had a flashlight in my tent, but was too frightened to even think about turning it on. <laughs> I would be too, buddy. I've had an I was I was 12, I, I might say, at the time, too. 12. Yeah, I went and I've had my... Uh, encounters with them whenever I'd be sitting in a tent too and uh, whenever I'd be asleep too uh, four o'clock in the morning was whenever mine happened and you talk about another type of uh, terrified too it's different whenever you can see them but whenever you can't see them that's what makes it even worse yeah. so um, there's another one Dale is asking another question he says um, I guess he's referring to the state of California. Is there any ban on shooting a Sasquatch in the state of California? No, there's not. Hmm. I've yeah, heard... uh, there's somebody that was trying to bring a uh, lawsuit with the, uh, when was it? I think March, but that went nowhere. Hmm. Um, so let's get on to your second encounter. I mean, your first one is, got, I mean, it's got the hair on my neck standing up, and I can I can understand how you feel at such a young age, because I was young, too. I was nine years old whenever I had my first encounter, and I didn't even see one. I heard it, and I understand the kind of uh, uh, mental imprint it left on you, so I can understand. Um, before we go on to this other uh, story, James asked another question. Could you tell about how tall the creature was? I am going to take a rough guess by what the angle of the moon would have been and guessing that it was probably five or six feet away from the back of my tent. And I saw it from the shoulders down. It was probably seven, eight feet-ish, somewhere in there. Oh, wow. Big old boy. And then, uh, before we move on, Michael asks one more question. What was the weather like that night? Clear. Totally clear. Hmm. 
Uh, the the temperature when it in the evening up there, even in late summer, it gets close to freezing. So it didn't quite make freezing, but it was probably in the 30s in the evenings, 80s in the daytime, mid to upper 80s probably. Oh wow! Sounds like Southern Illinois caught hot one day, cold the next. So okay. Yeah, let's get on to the second one. Go ahead and, and uh, just go right down the list of what happened. Okay. Let me tell you my dad's. His would have been the next, him and my grandpa. They were coming back from town um, for a gro from a grocery trip. It was probably 3 in the afternoon. Um, they got, this was uh, deer hunting. They got um, within probably a mile of camp. And my dad was, and they, they were both looking for deer on either, both sides of the truck. My dad was ah, looking from the driver's side and my grandpa would have been looking the other direction. My dad hit the brake, says, ah, there's one. And then he looked at it and uh, my grandfather looked over and my dad punched the, punched the gas and just took off. And he's going, what, 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 what? All he, all my grandfather saw was, you know, just a quick um, glimpse of deer color, the buff. And my dad, here, um, probably five, six years ago now, maybe, um, finally told me that he saw a Bigfoot. It was doing exactly the same thing as the one the Patty film was doing, how it was walking along and turned back to look at him, but it was going the opposite to opposite direction. It was going from the right to the left. And he said it was probably about six feet tall and buff in color. And then he punched it. The uh, guys went out the next day and looked for uh, tracks, but again, it's a, a lava area, and it was too uh, much lava rock on the ground to leave an impression. The only only way you're gonna find an impression up there uh, where we deer hunt is if it's near a mud or a pond and leaves it in the mud, or the powder that collects on the side of the road from the dust. That is the only way you're gonna find a, a track up there. And this his was somewhere between 76 77 about the the same it was either the same year like the next month in august or the following year in august he wasn't exactly sure on the date hmm. so that was his and i might mention that uh, uh kelly shaw did a how I entered, got introduced with him, I ran across one of his broadcasts that said, Pitville Road, that's the road I hunt off of. And he had the exact same story, exact same spot as my uh, dad's, except for it was in the 90s and it was eight feet tall, same color. So You said the, the 90s, road. you're talking about the time frame? Yeah, in the 1990s. My dad was in 76 or 77. The story Kelly Shaw did was from the 90s, and it was the exact same spot, roughly, um, from his description. And it was also the tan, tan to buff colored, but this one was about eight feet tall. Did your... I thought that was pretty cool. Did your dad say how the fast it was moving? Was it like in a... a Just like the Patty film. Just a steady walk. Yep. And it didn't. And the way your dad put it, it made you think it was it didn't feel threatened, or was it like surprised? No, he said it was just um, walking. He, said, he was walking when he seen it, and that's he stopped, and then he was watching it, and then it turned around and looked at him like the uh, patty one did, you know, over the shoulder, and that's when he punched it and got out of there. <laughs> Oh, wow. See, I've had encounters like that, too. One encounter uh, a year ago, whenever one walked across the road in front of me, um, not actually not far from the main highway out here, Route 13, 
not even a mile. And uh, that thing just cruised right in front of my truck. So I got a, a personal question. Why is it you think that with all the reports of Sasquatch that's been made on highways and back roads, why hasn't one, we've hit one yet and had a body to uh, prove they exist? They travel in groups, so they probably get drug off by the other ones. My thinking, what they do with them afterwards, I don't know if they eat them, they bury them, whatever. But I do believe they clean up their their remains. Hmm. Very interesting. So let's go ahead and let's get on to the third encounter. And while ever while ever my, my second encounter was in I can't remember if it was 77 or 78 it was like a quarter mile from where my dad saw and grandpa saw that uh, straight behind our camp and it's a spot we call Buck Hill because there are just so many bucks on that thing um, we were doing a drive hunt where um, half the group goes on a road down below and half the group goes up high and the upper group drives down making noise and stuff uh, to scare the deer down to the people below. Um, I was on the walk down the hill duty and we were went towards the top of it of this hill. Excuse me, Nats are getting me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we were walking down. And there's this, there was this, this area that was a, it was an old, old, old burn area and they had replanted the trees and the trees are probably, I don't know, 20, 25 feet tall, but they were still close together. They were probably three feet apart. So it was like, it was about 50 yards deep and I don't know, hundred yards long. And I was walking into that. I went from the top of hill from old growth. I walked through some manzanita, which is that tall brush. And then I walked, was walking into this deep dark jungle of trees. It was so spooky in there. And I got a little ways in there. And then all of a sudden I heard this uh, muttering. It was like somebody was just totally disgusted muttering mumbling under the breath near the back without where I don't I got that was coming from behind me. So I turned around and I'm looking and I'm walking from north to south and this noise is coming from the west headed east. And it was in the Manzanita and you could follow the sound. You couldn't see anything, but you could follow the sound until it went out of out of range. And it was just disgusted. I'm sure because I was making noise, that was the purpose to scared the deer down to the people below and no, I didn't know it at the time because um, I there was no information on Bigfoot back then but that always stuck in my, in my mind because it was such an odd sound odd thing and there was nobody else that hunted that zone because the requirements of the size of the deer was uh, it had to be much bigger than any of the other zones and it was a really tiny zone, so nobody else hunted in it. And it just always stuck in my mind. So I, I didn't know till you know, in the last few years what it was, samurai chowder, that it was doing. But it always had stuck in my mind. And uh, so, you was I remember you talking on uh, Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio that you said it sounded like a uh, Tasmanian devil from Looney Tunes going, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly what it sounded like. Just that kind of a, a broken babble kind of like? Yeah, it, sound, it sounded like, like words, but they were not intelligible words. It was just it was like it was really just like, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, like that. But it, it sounded like it was saying words just they weren't words that i could understand sound kind of like a uh extinct angle uh, extinct language yes that's very interesting i've heard 
in last couple years since I've started using audio recording technology for my research. Um, I've heard I've heard similar stuff like that, and especially with the Sierra sounds that Ron J. Moorhead re uh, recorded in the Sierras. Um, that was uh, a breakthrough, especially with whether or not if Bigfoot could talk. And it still has yet to be uh, proven or disproven, so it's still on the table. So it's still on the table that um, it, that uh, Bigfoot ha has a type of language. Um, especially now that while we're on the subject of Bigfoot having a language, uh, do you think they have a type of uh, a sign language like apes do? Yes. I do. I think they have verbal and they have uh, um, hands, gestures, hmm. and sounds like the banging. Like they got, especially like I've heard reports of a certain pattern with whether it's uh, wood knocks or if it's rock clacks. Um, like, do you think they have like their own form of like a Morse code? Yes, some something that probably like two mean something. One means something, three means something. I don't know if it's like the repetition, like I said, mine did it in sets of three, three to four times. I don't know if like the duration of it means something, but I'm definitely sure that you know, like the one, two, and three means something to them. Very interesting. See, that's a lot of things that people are so... Um, they're too busy out researching. They're trying to uh, prove that these things exist, but they're not really studying their behavioral uh, stuff. That's what I do as a researcher. I try to study behavior. I try to get certain reactions out of them, and I try to break it down. Oh, yeah. I've got plenty of behavior stories for you. The, you know, the one that was probably plucking on the rocks was probably telling the others that, you know, here's dinner and a little puppy snack. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> <laughs> Very quite possible. So, uh, uh, while that there's no other questions on the chat about this, hold on, there's uh, one I forgot. Um, Dale asked another question. He says, have you ever found scat in the woods to, uh, to possibly determine what they could eat if it was possible squatch scat? Uh, I, I know I have ran across larger scat um, in my earlier years hunting, I would have attributed it to a bear or a big bear um, because I did not associate Bigfoot with being up there where I deer hunted until my last encounter in 82. Even though I, it was in my head <laughs> that, you know, things were happening and that could not be a bear it just wasn't clicking or my mind wouldn't let it click in one of the two i'm not sure exactly which one very interesting okay also um i mentioned um about 79 ish somewhere probably i think it was like a sophomore in high school somewhere right in there uh, me and a friend went up there uh, hunting, and about a quarter mile from the Samurai Cheddar, which is also was a quarter mile from where my dad seen his, but this was a, another quarter mile um, further f from mine than it was a half mile from where my dad saw one. We walked up the back of this uh, Buck Hill, and I ran across a fort. It was in a clearing like the size of a football field and at the very bottom um, there was some big game trails that came together and there was this tree probably eight ten inches around that had been snapped off about two feet off the ground but it was still connected by some um, stringy stuff to the stump but the top of it had been placed on a boulder probably 10, 12 feet away. It was also about two feet off the ground. All the branches on the side closest to the deer trail was stripped off. All the branches underneath it were stripped off. And the ones on top 
and the ones on the far side were still there and intact. And it had taken strips of bark and uh, sticks and, you know, th around sticks and thin sticks that were snapped off to just tall enough to reach past the log that was laying across. And it was open on both ends, but all this other stuff was stacked up against the log to make a fort. And I've always thought, you know, we're 26 miles from anywhere. Why the heck is somebody building a fort up here and nobody else is here? And then, like I said, within the last few years, I've uh, discovered that it was probably a shelter they built, but I'm guessing an ambush shelter because it was right there at the game at the uh, where the trails for the deer all met um there's a question here um but before i get to this question um how you said there was a shelter was it anything like the one in the marble mountain footage that they found um i don't recall what that one is it's where the um a bunch, it's like a church group or a Boy Scout troop where they found. Oh, that's the one where they seen it up on Where the they seen it coming down later. the ridge, yeah. No, it wasn't like this. This was just a log going across from a, a stump to a rock and then debris stacked up along to like enclose it off. It was, they were all together and to, except for both ends, about two and a half feet, three feet. On both ends, it was open. It was something you could get in and out of. Why do you think they build stuff like that, especially with these uh, structures? Do you think it's like a, a marker, a form of communication, uh, like a, a no trespassing sign that, like we use? What's your take on that? Um, well, majority of the shelters that I've seen are not really don't look like they would be good for anything unless it is to um, throw off like uh, the prey's vision, like thinking that, hey, this is a tree or a bush and they're not really looking at like something that's inside of it that would like to jump out and attack them. To me, that's the more logical thing because the majority of these things that I've seen are just the skeleton of a TP. They're not really fortified with brush and roofs to keep out weather and rain and wind and all that stuff. So to me, it's just, um, to me, I'm thinking it's more of a disguise to hide them or conceal them partially from the vision of prey. So like a hunting blind. Yes. Very interesting. Um, before we get on to uh, your next uh, thing, uh, Dale is has a question. He says, do you think that they could be a primate? Yeah, I think they are. I think they're not related to humans at all. I think they're their, they are their own thing is what I think. And when you say their own thing, what do you mean by that? You know how like a mountain gorilla is a mountain gorilla, a human is a human. I think a Bigfoot is a Bigfoot. They're not related. So they're uh, apart from humans, but they're still a part of the primate family? Yes. The non-human primate, primates, yes. But they're, they're their own thing. Like if you want to throw a dog in the mix dog is its own thing or a canine or something i guess that was a bad one because we so we spread them to make a gazillion different versions but you, you see what i mean there it's its own type of animal hmm is what I think. very interesting so let's get on to the you said this is uh Report number three of your own. You've shared your dad's. Uh, we still got two more to go. So uh, this my third my third one mm -hmm. is an easy one. We were doing another drive. I was on top of top 
pushing gear down. Uh, we went through some old growth um, into some manzanita, and I went to a clear cut. Um, it was like the size of a football field, and I was hugging the left side up against the trees heading down. And I got like a third of the way through it, and I heard this cheap guttural growl that you know, echoed through my body, shook my body behind me. And I flipped around, and I looked, and I'm scanning the imaginative, you know, thinking something horrible is back there. But it, it, it couldn't be a bear, because bears can't go that low, and they have a, I don't know how to describe a bear's grrr sound compared to what this thing was. This thing was like, way deep, 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 deep tones, and I didn't see anything, so instead of hugging the trees, I walked out to the very center of this, this uh, clear cut, um, then I see my uncle over in the next one, so then I wasn't so worried, and I went ahead and finished walking down, that was the end of that one. So was you saying it was, uh, was it using infrasound, was it zapping you, was it giving like a warning, like stay out? Um was probably using infrasound to um it because it made my body shake and um it was given probably giving me a warning because like i said we were making noise to drive them down oh i might also add that these are all my sightings the number the second one with the samurai and this one were about 10 o'clock in the morning and from various interactions i think they were sleeping and these were on top of hills or very close to the top of hills and i think i woke them up because my intent was to make noise going down and i think i disturbed them in their sleeping spot high up where they thought it would be safe that nobody would be around so um there was um another a question that james lowe had here a while back and uh he asked he says have you ever uh, seen eye glow uh, their eyes glow or eye shine no yeah once i um, seen or heard or seen or heard at night. I didn't because I was inside of a tent. All the others were daytime encounters. Very interesting. So you've seen the silhouette of one. Your dad's seen one. You've heard uh, infrasound. You've heard, found a hunting blind of a Bigfoot. And you have heard samurai chatter. Yeah. Does it get any better than that? I mean, that's hard yes, to this, beat. Yes, this next one is horrible. This is my worst one. Number four. Um, it was uh, 1981. I was a junior. We'd already been up hunting our two weeks in archery season. I uh, went home. And we were going to go up the last weekend before um, archery season closed. So um, I had ran across this pond on uh, one of the back roads I went on that I'd never seen before. So I decided, you know, I didn't have any transportation at the time. So when we were going to come again, I was going to have a three wheeler and I was going to sit at that because it already had a blind, an old blind that was built up in the trees. So um, we went up there. Uh, first first day, I would get there about, um, well, in the morning, and then in the afternoon, about 3 o'clock, and then I would stay till um, sundown. And this, the first day um, I was up there, I had does and fawns come in. I took pictures of them. I had my 35 millimeter with me camera. Um, next day, 
going there, uh, driving to the stand in the afternoon, I hit Buckbreast just before I got to the stand, and it drove a thorn into my pinky knuckle. Ooh. And so I went ahead and got up in the stand, and I tried to um, cut it out, and it wasn't working because my knife was, I guess, too dull. It wasn't sharp enough to make a slit so I could push it out because it went deep below the skin. And I was trying to then match up the hole that it went in with the edge of the thorn, and when I pushed to pop the thorn through it, it just drove it deep into my knuckle. So now my pinky stuck straight out. It won't bend. So I get down, and my hunting day was screwed up. So I went to camp, waited for uh, the others to get back in, take me to town, to the hospital. They had to surgically remove it. And so now my pinky's in a splint. So the last day there, um, I go, it was again about 3 in the afternoon. And um, I parked my three-wheeler about 100 yards from the stand. And I um, walked to my stand down the road. And I decided, you know, I better go relieve myself before I get up there and wait all evening. And so I went behind me where I figured deer wouldn't be coming from because it went back about 100 yards. And then it did a, like a 45-degree angle downhill to like a lake that was 2,000 feet lower in elevation. It was really steep, and I didn't figure any deer were going to be coming from that direction. So I walked in probably 30, 35 yards, did my business, went back to the stand, climbed up, and I was just turning around to sit down. I was just starting to sit when, oh, my God, it was like a T-Rex intensity. sounded like a lion, but with T-Rex intensity, you know, Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. that, ah, right behind me. I managed to finish sitting down, and I'm, you know, like very, very, very slowly turning my, my head to see what's standing behind me. And whatever it was, was just out of my visual range. All I could see from the branches was just the other uh, opposite edge of the road. The tree stand was probably five foot off the road. This one was. And all I could see was just right to the far edge of the road. And whatever was, was standing just beyond that. And so I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm just, my eyes are glued you know, skinny back and forth right there, trying to figure out what the heck is going on, what it is, because, you know, my mind still, there's no such thing as Bigfoot in that area where I'm hunting. And I know, I know it's not a bear or, or a mountain lion. So pretty soon, probably 15 minutes later, um, it did it again, but this time it was in front of me and I'm sitting in an area that's probably um, the size of a football field, a little bit longer in length, and it went up a hill. It was a clear cut. And I'm up against the right-hand side, five foot off the road in this tree, and right in front of me is this uh, small pond. And this came from just, you know, just before it went up the hill, just probably 100 yards a little more than 100 yards, and on my left inside the tree line, I couldn't see it. But you had did the same sound. So I'm now my eyes is very glued because I'm thinking it circled around, and now it's in, in front of me. So I'm watching over there where that second noise came from. And out of the, my peripheral vision, you know, I'm sitting there watching it, I see this big, tall, black thing step off the road and into the tree line heading towards that second noise. So I'm thinking, oh, my God, I cannot stay here. And, you know, the, the sun's going to be going down soon, and I'm going to be stuck in this tree, and I'm going I'm to be alive. So I waited like an hour. There's no other noise. There's no, and nothing came around again. There were no sounds, no birds, no crickets, no squirrels, just dead silent. So I waited about an hour. I got down on the tree and I ran for that tree roller. I didn't look into the woods. I just got on it and booked it back. 
That was number. That was number four encounter. So do you, here's a question. Um, do you you said you heard two sounds, correct? And then you seen the yes. one take off off the road. Yeah, the one that after the second sound, I'm look now looking in front of me, and I'm watching that spot, and I caught a glimpse of the first one. Uh, just stepping off the road into the forest, heading towards the second one. Do you think that you were caught in the middle of a hunting party? Um, that I'm not sure if they could have been going there to hunt. They could have been going there to drink. But more than likely, I think it saw me doing my business in the woods and was the one that was behind me that came right up to me was letting me know about it basically uh, saying so I, get out you're in my house I, I marked his territory and he was not happy that's what i'm thinking but did, they could have been coming there to get a drink or they could have been waiting for deer to come to the pond to ambush them um Dale asked another question, Dale yesterday. He says, did you feel like it wanted to attack you, or was it possibly like hunting you? I thought it was going to kill me, <laughs> is what I thought. So you uh, you did feel threatened and everything, and you're right there. Uh, you had you said it was archery season, so you, yeah. so you had a, a bow, a compound bow recurve. I had a compound bow. I also had my 35 millimeter camera on me hanging around my neck, but that was the last thing on my mind was to take a picture. I was thinking death, try to survival. I wasn't thinking take a picture. Well, um, with all these reports and everything of them having run-ins with the Native Americans and the Native Americans having spears or arrows, why do you think that they didn't attack you, though? I mean, you're sitting there with a recur with a recurve uh, compound bow and no kind of firearm. What do you think held him off? Uh, he was probably just warning me. But it was right there. It could, from where I was sitting in the tree, I couldn't see it because of the the limbs where I the where my head was. I couldn't see it, but I'm very sure it could see me from like. Uh, my waist down. I'm sure it could see me, but I just couldn't see it because my head was up high looking down through the branches. So you think it could have been just bluffing you, like intimidation factor? Yeah, he, 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 he did a good job of it, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, very, very interesting. I've... Uh, like I again with myself, I've had intimidation factor where they've uh, chased me out of the woods. I've heard them roar at night, and uh, well, whenever I'd be sitting in my hunting blind, because I hunt on the ground, I'll never hunt in a tree. I'm scared to death of heights. Um, they are like they notice you whenever you're closer to the ground. I guess because your scent carries a lot better than it does up a tree. So. Um, I uh, basically I think it's just intimidation factor, but uh, the really reason I think that they would even attack is whenever you back them in a corner, or they don't have a way out and they're going to turn and fight. So you say was this in the open? You said it was like five feet from the road. Yeah, it was about five feet from the road is where the uh, tree stand started, the back side of it. Um, I had a view of probably twenty five feet, which was the far side of the road. And it was standing just beyond that, so he was really close to me. Very interesting. So, so basically, you had enough room to let out, and he had enough room to let out, so there was no really a uh, chance of a possible physical encounter. Oh yeah, he could he could have very well went over there and got me. I was so probably ten feet up in the tree. Um, he could have easily just reached up there and snagged me out of there if he wanted to. And you was you you were on the ground, correct, or was you in? The... I, I was I was in the tree when it, it when it uh, roared at me, but I was just on the ground. 
So you were leaving myself back where he came from. Oh boy. Wow, wow. So, All right. Number four. Number five was the next year, 1982, one mile down the road from number four encounter, this one in the tree. Oh, I might mention too. I've only heard of two other people that have peed in front of them and got warned for it. Never attacked them. It just did that same roar at them for doing it. Hmm. Okay, so next next year, 1982, my senior year, I had already graduated, was up there again, and one mile down the road, um, we were in a truck, me and my sister were in the back. It's this again, this is an August archery season. Um, I'm looking downhill, like I said, it was this portion that we were in, the where it brought the 45 degrees down at that lake below. But this one was the angle was right there at the edge of the road on my side. Her side was a six foot bank, and then it went up at that about that angle, too. And so I'm looking downhill, she's looking uphill. Uh, we're driving along, and I just happened to glance over her side for some reason. And I see this uh, water squirting out of the ground on her side. It was probably about two to three feet back from the bank. And it was like just like a, about as big as around, like you turn the water uh, hose on and you're fast on the outside the water hose. It was squirting up like that, about 10 inches or so high, and it went out, and then it came, dropped back down, but it was not coming back off the bank. It was being instantly sucked back into the ground for some reason. So, I, you know, thinking, okay, well, that's weird. <laughs> and so we're continuing driving. I'm looking downhill, and it's uh, old Manzanita. Um, from an old burn area. Uh, it was probably, I don't know, four to six feet high-ish maybe. Uh, there were some young pine trees, 15 or so feet tall, growing. And then st scattered around here and there, the pine trees were. And we were coming up on an old growth portion on my side that the branches were hanging over into the um, road. And you have to either duck or put your arm up so the limbs don't swipe you off or hit you in the face. And so we're getting close to that. So I happened to glance over to look at that, uh, the, see how close we were getting. And then I saw, you know, probably 10 foot off the road, um, a Bigfoot. He had his right hand, he was probably 10 feet off the road, he had his right hand and pulled the top of the tree over. Uh, the tree, I'm guessing, was probably 15 or so feet tall. And you could see his left shoulder, and you could see his head from about um, his lips. It, we came across his lips, so you couldn't see his lips, but you could see from the top of his, where his upper lip would be, all the way the rest of the way up. So I got from the lips up, I could see its head and I could see its left shoulder. And it was jet black. It had gorilla skin looking color face, jet black, black hair that was neat, neatly kept, probably inch and a half or so long on its head. I couldn't see its ears. Its face was totally hairless. Uh, you know, you know how the Patty film it shows she has a mustache mm -hmm. in her nose. This didn't. It had. It was totally skin, like like a gorilla's face. I can remember seeing big nostrils. Uh, its eyes were wide, like it was in shock, and it had its like it had tipped its head backwards. Is what it looked like. Like it was like <sighs> in shock, just like oh my gosh, it saw me. And um. Then I looked downhill, and when I looked back, it had let loose a branch. So the top of the tree is just rocking back and forth. 
and I saw one that was on all fours going between the tree that it was just at, and there was another tree probably gone or 10 feet away. In the space in between the two trees, I could see from the knees forward and the elbows back. It was jet black. It had and it had a silver back. And um, I had always assumed that it was something jumping off of the big one, like it was holding a baby or something. Maybe jumped off, but it wasn't till within the last five or so years that um, I found out that they go down on all fours when they get scared to run faster. And that would explain why it had a silver back. It was so long from, you know, like the knees to the elbows, like ten, being roughly 10 feet in that gap between those trees that I saw. And then by this time, by the time it let loose, we were probably 20 yards from me going by to where it was standing. So I, I, I backed up against my sister, which was on the other side of the truck. And I did not want to look where it was standing because I thought it was still standing there. And when we went by there, I just gave it a quick, a quick, you know, glance over and it wasn't, it was gone. It was, the space was probably between that tree and the old growth was probably about 10 foot um, wide and about 40 feet deep of just clear open area. And then it disappeared into Manzanita. So it, it booked on all fours to get out of there. Then, it, so then and there, I knew that there were um, Bigfoots in there, and I didn't hunt again until the last uh, three or four years that I've hunted again. But I have a handicap permit now, so I, I can never hunt alone again. I have to always hunt with somebody who can track a deer if I hit it. Mm -hmm. So that was number five encounter, which was um, the, the year before was my fourth encounter, which was a mile down the road. And oh, I don't know if I told you or not, this thing was about 10 feet tall from where he, the road was, the side of the hill where he was standing. Um, was already slanted at a 45 degree angle, so he was lower already. I was in the back of a truck, and he was still like another two feet taller than me, so I'm guessing 10 feet tall, which would also be roughly probably the height of the one that I've seen a glimpse of stepping off the road into the um, forest the previous year would have been about that tall also jet black so i'm assuming that it was probably the same creature and i'm guessing like i told you about 10 o'clock they were sleeping on top of the hills mm -hmm. around 3 to three thirty, um i think they're starting to wake up for the evening to go like get a drink of water to get ready for the evening that's just from what I've seen because my dad and grandpa also there between three and um, three and three thirty and the um, one on my tree stand was about the same time and that uh, ten footer I saw in eighty two was about three to three thirty and all the other ones where I was walking down the hill were all about ten in the morning. So I'm pretty sure around 10 in the morning, they're sleeping at the top of the hill. And three or so is when they're starting to wake up to move around, get ready for the evening. So um, before we um, close out, I've got some uh, questions. one more. Oh, okay. This one was last year, 2017. I went to... Um, film, it was the 41st anniversary of my first encounter, and I went up to that spot. Um, it is now a public campground, so it's got a road in, it's got a bathrooms, it goes in and it does a, a circle around at the end, 
and comes back out uh, the road that you go in on. Um, I camped just about where the tree would have been from my first encounter that I had backed up against. The tree was gone, but the pile of willows out by the creek was, was still there. Um, which I was directly across the road from the, the bathrooms. Um, there were two, three, three or four other campers. They were down in the in the circle loop, and I was the only one that was in the straight area. And the first day, um, I just partially set up camp. Uh, the second day, um, I went out and I filmed what. From the Bigfoot's point of view, I walked how it would have walked and what it did. That's how I filmed it. And um, then that night, um, I was sleeping. And again, it was almost a full moon, just give or take a day or two. And I had the dog in the tent with me. And again, somewhere between probably 1 and 3 in the morning, I heard crunch, crunch, crunch coming across well the only reason i heard it is because the dogs are growling lightly growling and i woke up and you could hear it lightly crunching so i'm listening okay so is this what is this a bear or something no it's not a bear it's it's walking on two feet but it's little whatever it is is really little it's not big at all and so i'm listening to it and it got straight across from me at the bathrooms and um you could hear it go step up. Oh, it went to, it, first it went to the, uh, where they have the uh, recycles. And it had those bear proof containers, those ends. And you could hear it shaking it. And then it quit. And then you could hear it step off the gravel road onto, you could tell it went off to the dirt. And then all of a sudden you hear um, there were three, uh, those galvanized garbage cans mm -hmm. that people threw their garbage in, not recyclables, the actual garbage was food and stuff like that in it. And all of a sudden you hear the lid lift off one and uh, set back down and you, this, um, I can't remember which I did first. Um, I think that you hear the, the little foot steps come back onto the um the gravel like it just stepped off the dirt back onto the gravel and you hear it go <clears throat> like that and then you can hear the you can, it was not facing me you could tell it was facing the other direction and then you hear the garbage another garbage can lid lift up set back down and then the third one lift up and set back down and i fl i have a had a uh, light with a remote control on it outside my tent where my food was and I flipped it on. I can't remember if it was just before it grunted or just after it grunted. And then it got dead quiet. It, the little one walked back off the gravel into the dirt. It was like a minute or two later in the uh, circle area where these other four people are camped, like probably right dead in between them. You hear this big old pow, like something hit a tree. You know how you watch in the movies where uh, they're sawing down a tree, all of a sudden you hear it start crackling and buckling and making all that crunchy noise, and then all of a sudden, push and bam, it did that. And then it was dead quiet. So I think it was mad, and it punched a tree, and <laughs> you could hear it. I don't know how big it was. I um but you could hear it, you know, the snapping, cracking, and the swoosh, and then it hit the ground. But uh, the next morning when I woke up, I was um, sick. I had to uh, walk over to the next camp and ask them if they could load up my camp, and because I couldn't do it, and why they were loaded up. Um, finally, I said, you know, I can't do this. Somebody needs to call 911. So they called 911 and had to climb the top of a mountain to call 911 so they get reception. And then the ambulance came and got me about an hour later, found me. So that was the end of it. I don't know if it was just happened to be sick 
and it's just a coincidence or if it hit me with infrasound when I turned the light on or what happened, but I was sicker than a dog. I was in the hospital for uh, six days, went home for five days, and then he put back in the hospital again for 10 days. It was horrible. That was my last encounter. That was last year, and I have to admit, um, I was not terrified this time that it was outside my tent. I was anxious, but I was not terrified. So, getting a little better with um, digging into it and knowing what they do and what they don't do and why they do it supposedly and all that stuff. That's the end of my encounters. Well, after that one, I'm glad that you're still here, buddy. I was supposed to get you on last year, and then you had that stroke of, stroke of bad luck with your health and everything, and I'm glad yeah, you're doing it. That's what, that's what it was. <laughs> that's what oh, I couldn't do it last year. It took like five months to get over that. Yeah, we're, I'm especially, I'm glad. I, I bet a whole lot of us here in the community and those that are watching still that we're glad that you're back in good health and everything. And uh, I'm just in awe of all this stuff that's happened to you and everything. Um, before I close out, I want to ask you a couple questions um, that is a very that's very frequently asked to me, and I want to get your input on them. Um, whenever people go and they say Bigfoot doesn't exist, what's your argument towards that? do i saw it i saw it i know and uh, they say if you see him why haven't why haven't you got a picture of him well with that encounter with you wherever you were out hunting and doing your business you had the camera right around your neck like you said that's the last thing on your mind is trying to get a picture you're more worried about getting out alive yeah that that when the tree stand i had it around my neck and the very next year when that one was uh, standing they were looking at me with the tree bent over I had it around my neck too and no there's there is absolutely no way of thinking of that because um, you're all you're doing is thinking about uh, saving your life you know or worrying about taking a picture exactly that's what I say and everything I mean like I tell everybody they ask me so many times they say well you've seen these things so many times Zach why haven't you you got a picture and I say, well, when you're sitting within feet of a creature that is very unpredictable and it's a 50-50 shot if they choose to run or they choose to fight, you're more worried about getting out of there with your life and keeping an eye on them than you are worried about trying to fiddle with a camera or your camera phone trying to get a picture. Like 50 years ago at Bluff Creek with Roger and Bob, they got lucky. It's a stroke of luck if anyone ever gets one on camera. Yep. Plus, plus, just to give them an idea, that uh, last one I saw, my uh, fifth encounter in 82, where I was in the back of the truck, um, like I said, I could see its head, and I could see its left shoulder. From the outside edge of its left shoulder to center line was probably two and a half to three feet. So you're talking five and a half to six feet wide at the shoulders and about 10 feet tall. If they want to get an idea how big uh, 10 feet tall is, your ceiling is roughly eight feet tall. Imagine just the top of the shoulders being another foot roughly higher than that and another foot to the top of a head above that. That is how tall it was. And imagine that being six foot wide at the shoulders. You're thinking of death to you. You're not going to stop and take a picture of that. Definitely not. I mean, it's fight or flight, and you're worried about, and it's you're in survival mode. Your your primal instincts come out. You're more worried about surviving than you know getting a picture. Exactly. I mean, if you're going to take a picture of these things, you got to have nerves of steel like you would if you're get, trying to get a picture of a charging rhino and some and the and you're trying to get a uh, picture of a charging rhino, you're more worried about surviving than getting gored to death. Yeah, I could probably 
probably do it now if it was a distance away from me. I would probably be comfortable enough to see that I was safe if it was not making any aggressive moves or walking towards me or running towards me. I could probably, if I had a camera with me, be able to think of, hey, take a picture. But if it was anywhere close to me or coming at me, there would be no way that I would be thinking the fight and flight response. Definitely. Um, two more questions. Uh, before we close out, what, for the, for the new people that's getting into the field and everything, and for people that have yet to see one, what shred of wisdom would you leave our viewers with, Bob? None of my encounters. Um, I did not go looking for them. We either ran into each other by accident or they uh, sought me out. So um, I would say just don't force it. Um, I've been in that area since I was a, a little kid walking through the, the hills and stuff. So I'm guessing that they were familiar with me. It could be one of the reasons they didn't kill me. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure that was one of the reasons they were familiar with me, that they felt comfortable enough to reveal themselves or what you or whatever. <laughs> but I wouldn't push it. It would probably have better luck. And like I said, um, in the mornings, they apparently are on top of the hills sleeping where they think it's safe. And they come out around 3 o'clock, 3.30 to seek out water or a snack before dinner or something that has seen to have been the um, most exciting times or the best way to go about doing if they not necessarily go out and look, but if they want to do those kinds of things, be near water around 3, 3.30, or um, be on top of a hill, walking around around 10, they might get lucky, but I wouldn't go looking because they would probably sense the, the, you're hunting them. I think they're intelligent enough to know that. <laughs> Um, I agree with you wholeheartedly that, on that one. They don't pee in front of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's probably about it. So, and final question: What's next for Bobby Rich? Um, I am going to go up um, hunting again this year. I filmed all my locations where I've had incidents, and I've had my. My dad's encounter, I filmed it. The only one I haven't been able to find is the shelter. I haven't been able to find that spot again. And I am going to hopefully be able to find the tree stand and that spot where I saw the one standing by the road and that water spring shooting out of the side, side of the mountain that goes right back in. I'm hoping to find that this, this coming year, or this year, this year, in August. But again, I won't be looking for them. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll meet each other again. Well, like I like it always, like that uh, uh, old Murphy's Law says. Um, this is kind of a rough shot on it. If it is meant to happen, if it's go if it anything can happen, it will happen. Yeah. Oh, I might want to mention there's a uh, where I had my first and my uh, last encounters in that one spot. Um, in the tent in 76 and then last year um, there's a local hunter from Bigfoot hunter from Fresno that's going to be heading up very within like 13 miles of where all this took place and since I cannot get off the road and go physically still myself I am going to meet him up there and show him uh, the location of where this happened and 
um, another couple of miles away, a good place to camp that is not a public campground that is right within like a half a mile of a very, very squatchy looking place that is ripe with everything they need, even berries, different kinds of berries, wild raspberries and uh, gooseberries and fish, all sorts of stuff. So I'm going to meet him up there, show him so at least somebody can um, get up there and research and doing stuff that I can't do. Well, that's that's good, especially good of you because you've had all these years under your belt, these encount all these under all these types of encounters under your belt. You're passing on your wisdom and your knowledge to the next generation. That's especially my hat my hat's off to you on that one. Uh you're you're not keeping it to yourself, you're passing your wisdom on to the next generation. Yeah. Somebody's gotta take up the torch. <laughs> exactly. That's what the way I would put it. Well, um, I do appreciate you coming on my show tonight, Bobby. Um, this has been a long time coming, and uh, from the, all the other times that I've heard your encounters on other shows, hearing it coming from your lips one on one, it's a totally different feeling. I'm awestruck. Okay, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it, buddy. You stay in contact with me, and uh, I'll talk to you later. Definitely will do. Happy hunting. Yep, have a good evening, brother. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. And that does it for the Season 3 premiere of Backwoods Investigations. I do uh, thank everybody for tuning in. A couple of announcements uh, before I close out. Um, July 27th at 6 o'clock in Crab Orchard, Illinois, at the Crab Orchard Public Library, um, there is going to be the first annual Southern Illinois Monster Hunters team uh, Bigfoot seminar going on. I, uh, it's free to the public. I will be putting it on. I invite everybody to come out and uh, share in this thing. There will be a meet and greet for the first half hour. I will be presenting the seminar for the next for the hour long seminar. And then for the last half hour, we'll be having a q and I'll have my booth set up and everything with my merchandise. Um, I'll even have some extra chairs and a little drop box if anyone has an encounter that you ha would like to share with me one on one or would you you would like me to follow up on it please do show up it's free to the public doors are open at six o'clock in the evening at the Crab Orchard Public Library also June 30th and July 1st in Fishersville Virginia at the Augusta Expo I will be emceeing for the ECBRO Virginia State Bigfoot Conference uh, I invite everybody to show up. Tickets are still on sale at $20 a pop. Ron J. Moorhead, the Ohio Night Stalkers, uh, Baltimore Gavon Jr., Tracy Arnold, uh, let's see, Darby Orcutt, Dr. Kimberly McGeorge, they'll all be there. The She Squatchers, especially the Midwest's first all female Bigfoot researchers team. I invite everybody to come out for that one. Until then, Stay tuned. I will be back soon with my next guest. We are not done yet on season three. There's still a lot more ground to cover. So until then, keep a wary eye out and keep your ears to the wind and your nose to the ground. This is Blimp signing off saying subscribe to the YouTube channel, Southern Illinois Monster Hunters. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, the Southern Illinois Monster Hunters. I invite everybody. We're about ready to break 500 likes. So let's keep it going. Get the word out. Reach out to us. We investigate uh, reports of cryptids, not just Bigfoot, all over the 618 area. Until then, I'll see you guys soon. And stay squatchy, everybody. And God bless.